I'm Jake. I'm Tom. We are Velocities in Music. On this podcast, Tom and I discuss a ladleful of topics pertaining to modern music, including artist deep dives and monthly and annual new music wrap-ups. Back in March of 2017, the band Spoon released their ninth album, which was called Hot Thoughts. This is a band Tom and I have been following for a number of years now, so today we'll be discussing Spoon's discography in detail chronologically as part of our Spoon Artist Deep Dive. But before we get started, you can help support Velocities of Music. Subscribe to Velocities of Music on your favorite podcasting device to automatically get our latest podcast episodes sent to your device for your listening pleasure. Want to help Velocities of Music grow? You can. Velocities of Music was founded on the idea of creating an enriching discussion about modern music. Please share Velocities of Music with the music enthusiasts in your life. Together, we can move music discussion forward. Tom. Yes. In our March deep dive, mm -hmm. we talked about Spoon's ninth album, Hot Thoughts. Just yeah, a little briefly. bit. We, we yep. mentioned it as a featured album. We said, this is we're really liking it. Mm -hmm. And the cat was out of the bag at that point. Like yeah. we, Everyone knows already that we like Hot Thoughts. Yes. But it, it kind of started earlier than that. We've been we've been listening to Spoon now for a number of years. Throughout mm -hmm. our, our time uh, as, as YouTube video album reviewers, uh, we reviewed Kill the Moonlight as a throwback review. Yep. We, and I think we did Transference when it came out. When it out. came out, yeah. And then we did They Want My Soul when it yeah. came out. Which actually, that one holds a special place in our, uh, in our history, Jake, because... They Want My Soul was the the last album we reviewed. That is true. Before we stopped. That before we true. mysteriously dropped off the face of YouTube. For, for a year. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're, we're still on YouTube. We publish no, well, these podcasts. Well, that's true. That's YouTube. true. Before our faces yes. stop, stopped yeah. appearing And, and just if you're wondering, our faces are very similar to what they it's were. It's true. Yeah. We're going to get some updated photography at some point in time. I mean, we, you know... But uh, there's really no point. We look exactly the same. A couple of years ago, we went full on John Travolta, Nick Cage, and, and Face Off, where we swapped faces. Yeah, that's and true. Those, that's no. true. I feel sorry for you. Because <laughs> I ended up with yeah, your face. That sucks. I got the raw end of the deal. <laughs> you sure did, buddy. Um, so I started I started getting into Spoon back in when I was in college at the time, and I was just looking for new music, stuff that was kind of along the lines of, of what I was into, which was very, very mellow, aesthetically pleasing indie rock. And, and I found the album Girls Can Tell, which had come mm -hmm. out in 2001. So this was about like 2005, 2006. I was rediscovering or discovering for the first time Girls Can Tell, Spoon's third album, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, but man, I, I just fell in love with that record. And, mm -hmm. and for a long time, that was the only spoon that I listened to. Um, and then kind of went away from, from the band. And then I, I know that at some point in time, a few years later, Tom, you had gotten into Ga 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 Ga, their fifth album, yeah. um, which came out in 2007. And you, you were showing me this album. There's a number of tracks I really like from that one too. Mm -hmm. And, but again, then went through periods of time where I didn't listen to Spoon until Velocities and Music started reviewing them. And then I really felt like I had a solid understanding of, of their discography. Yeah. The, the thing that's always been interesting to me about them is just that they have a very solid, consistent discography, yep. nine albums now, and they've reached the point where you can just rely on them to put something out that's good. Yeah. You know, their albums are varying in quality a little bit. You know, we'll still talk about which ones we like better or worse than others, but they've never just put out a crap album. They've never just been like, oh, don't listen to that one. You know, a lot of bands have that. I think that that, that kind of consistency is rare these days in music. So so for any listeners that we have who, who mm -hmm. may not be familiar with Spoon, which at this point I would imagine is, is pretty difficult if you're if you're into the indie music scene at all, how would you describe Spoon's sound? I mean, they're they're pretty classic guitar-based alternative rock indie rock band. In fact, one one comparison I'd like to make, maybe this is a stretch, so okay. call me out yeah, on no, it no, if it fine. is, but, but the analogy I like to make, in my mind, they've always been kind of like what Foo Fighters is to mainstream alternative rock. Mm -hmm. Spoon is to like indie alternative rock. Okay. Where Foo Fighters are a band that like you can kind of write them off as being somewhat generic, uh, somewhat just the, you know, the epitome, like I said, of like corporate radio rock through mm -hmm. the 90s sure. and 2000s. However, I would argue in favor of Foo Fighters that they've put out a number of really good albums. And really, when it comes down to it, who sounds like them? Right. Who can you really say sounds exactly like them? And, I would say those same things about Spoon, yes. only on the alternative side. Yeah. You know, they're they're pretty just classic. Like like when I think just like indie rock, which is at this point is kind of a useless catch-all term. 
But how else would you describe Spoon? Right. Like that's they, they really they are, embody that. They they seem to be the like one of the seminal indie rock bands mm-hmm. of the of the two thousands and in now twenty tens. Uh, a lot of uh, I, a lot of places that I read about Spoon use the term art rock mm-hmm. to describe their sound, and I think that the reason why um, you you get this indie rock slash art rock description is because of the sense of space in oh, their sure. sound. Their sound um, is, is Spoon throughout their discography, and, and we'll we'll talk about this as as we dive into their albums. Um, but it certainly gets very very specific yeah and in, in, i mean just so clean how polished the mix is it's everything is so specific every sound on every album that you hear matters and, and mm-hmm. it was designed these are very engineered albums um and it, and it really kind of makes you like as you dig into their music it really kind of makes you uh wonder about like the craft and how did these songs start and it's really cool to listen to some like early demos of their songs yeah. to see how they evolved into what they actually put on the album because because I think that these guys spend an extraordinary amount of time polishing these things in yeah. the studio to, yeah. to make that to, to make that like really pristine spacious art rock sound. And and they do something that I think any great band does where if a song doesn't feel right they don't force it. They let it develop and maybe put it on the next album. Mm-hmm. There are some songs uh, hopefully we'll remember to mention ended up that way. And I think it's great when bands do that because a song can have so many different lives, so many different versions, and to pick the right way to present it on the correct album in a context with other songs is, is really important. But I, I think along with that, Jake, you know, the phrase that I use is attention to detail. Mm-hmm. They have a, a, a keen sense of attention to detail on their albums where like you said everything's deliberate and they do that not only with the production and the sense of space but they also do that with the instrumentation Absolutely. incorporating a lot of small auxiliary percussion elements into the sound uh, as well as some supplementary horns things like that so i think that we've seen them from the beginning of their career uh really grow into something beyond just the traditional guitar rock band format okay that was great hype piece great hype piece i, yeah. s- I say it's time to dive into some Let's history do it. tom you are our resident uh, music historian. <laughs> okay. W- give us some history. Where did Spoon uh, come from? When did they form? Spoon comes from Austin, Texas, and they formed right at about around 1993. Okay. Uh, and it's always been centered around Britt Daniels as the main uh, guitarist, vocalist, main songwriter as well, uh, as well as Jim Eno, the the drummer and percussionist of the band. From there, they've had a number of lineup changes throughout the years in terms of bass player as well as additional guitarist and multi-instrumentalist. Uh, on the bass side, more recently, they've had Rob Pope since around 2007. Uh, and before that, the longest uh, tenured bass player was a guy named Josh Zarbo, who, who was kind of in the band for a while in like the late 90s, then took a break around the time Girls Can Tell came out, then came back. So there's been some lineup changes there, but I think that the core of the band has always been Britt Daniel and Jim Eno. All right. So April 23rd, 1996, Spoon drops their first record, Telefono, and it was actually, Tom, on Matador. Yes the record label and then later 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 we'll we'll get to this uh they they go through some label trouble and end up getting on uh merge uh for their third record girls can tell um and then they re-release telephono later on merge but to start with it was released on matador records and how would you describe telephono in in sound pixies yeah just that that, that covers (laughs) it that's pretty much it which it's funny because in preparing for this uh you know i listened i listened to the album and actually, I wasn't very familiar with Spoon's first two albums, Telefono and, Se- and A Series of Sneaks. So I listened, I put on Telefono, I was like, well, this pretty much sounds exactly like the Pixies. Yeah. Uh, and, and then, you know, I was doing research and it's like, critics have often compared Spoon's early work to the likes of Pixies, Pavement, and Wire. Mm-hmm. And I'm like... Oh man, now I'm just going to be saying the same stuff as as other people who, who've talked about this. But, but it's but it's there's the nothing new to say. It's That's the only, the only right. And and more, I, I've listened. You know, I hadn't listened to Telefono um, maybe more than like once or twice over the mm-hmm. years, um, just to, just to see what it sounded like. And you're totally right. It, it it just the first thing you think of is Pixies. But the more that you dig into it, you hear that that kind of like underground punk influence there um, that that I would attribute to to Wire. And there's certainly some pavement in in there as well. Uh, but but to me, the striking thing, especially if you've, your spoon entry point has been some of their later albums, um, the striking thing is that Telefono is comprised solely of electric guitar, bass, drums, and Brit 
Daniel's alt rock inspired vocals and in um, Brit Daniel actually has a fantastic rock vocal. He does voice. It, it's it's got the right combination of like unpolished grit, but mm-hmm. there's just this prettiness to it. And he, and I think he he performs it very well, mm-hmm. very well. He 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 really belts out the notes that he needs to belt out, and and it has like the shrillness to it. Like you can hear this texture in his voice, but it never sounds overwhelming. Um, it kind of sounds like a more sedated Kurt Cobain mm-hmm. at times, which sure. which in certainly on Telefono you hear a little bit of that Nirvana influence on this record. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's it's never overwhelming. It's just hints right. um, through throughout the record. But there's there's a number of tracks here that um, I actually think are are kind of indicative of where Spoon goes later on in their discography. They're they're certainly showing that they they can write strong songs from the get go. That these guys have songwriting talent, and and that's mm-hmm. something that is so important for a band to establish on their first record if they hope to to, to transcend that that like very indie mm-hmm. uh, debut album so one thing one thing that i, I want to get out of the way now because i'm going to be bringing this up pretty much from album to album i feel like spoon is a band that they never just put out any crap songs sure but i think their their better albums the albums that you remember more at least for me tend to be the ones that have standout tracks the ones that have highlights i think they're a band that relies on album highlights uh, to to really to really bring you back, and for me, Telefono doesn't have any stinker tracks on it, but it doesn't have as much in the way of highlights. Yeah. I think that this is more a style exercise mm-hmm. and a demonstration that they can really nail a certain attitude and a certain edge, uh, and that comes that does you know we mentioned the Pixies comparison. Another detail I want to provide around that is a lot of times I feel when people are comparing one band to another band it's only really in one dimension or one facet, right? Like maybe the production style sounds like this, or maybe the vocalist sounds like this other guy. You know, Britt Daniels doesn't really even sound all that much like Frank Black. Um, But what it comes down to is the writing is so similar. Even just, just really, really detailed songwriting nuances, like one thing Pixies do all the time is they'll write songs that sound like they're in like four four but really they're in like two four because they'll be in iterations of six beats Mm -hmm. you know what i mean there'll be six beat phrases but instead of being like two bars of three it's three bars of two right pixies do that all the time on here and uh, i'm sorry spoon does that all the time just as just as pixies would yeah right just as pixies would so they're using these songwriting elements also the producer john croslin uh the producer of telefono uh one thing that Britt daniels mentioned in Actually, I got to cite this article, Jake. There's a great article on Consequence of Sound that we read in preparation for this deep dive. Uh, that's an oral history of, of Spoon's discography, Britt Daniel going through and talking about each of the albums. One thing he says about Telefono is this producer, John Croslin, had this, this kick drum sound that sounded like someone dribbling a basketball. And that's the perfect comparison. And once again, uh, that's a sound that you heard a lot in the production style of like Gil Norton on Pixies Doolittle. So even the way it's being produced, the way they're writing the sounds really embodies that. Uh, But keep in mind, that's just as a starting point. And in the soundscape of the mid 90s, this just made a lot of sense on the alternative rock scene. Absolutely. So jumping into the songs that are on Telefono, I really think that this album is stronger on the front half than the back half, though I yeah. like this as a as a straight through listen. I, I don't want to underplay that. I just think that the weight of the quality of the tracks are on the front half. It starts off with uh, with the first track being Don't Buy the Realistic, which is just, I mean, an overwhelmingly Pixies track. And then uh, the second track is called Not Turning Off. It's one of my favorite songs on the record. Um, it has a really strong uh, uh, vocal hook and, and kind of some biting guitar, which I think you could use to describe every song on this yeah. record. Um, the guitars throughout this this album, I think, are are bright sounding. They're very well written, well performed. Um, I, I'm just a huge fan of just that clingy, um, alternative rock inspired guitar noise that they use. Um, but I I think that I think that what Spoon is doing throughout Telefono 
is they they are relying on these powerful choruses in on almost every single track and for as raw and distorted as as the sound is it's just this wall of noise at times spoon has this ability to provide an infectious pop hook and let that shine through their instrumentation in the in the wall of sound that they're creating and i think that that is their special sauce a number of these tracks um starting with not turning off but all the negatives have been destroyed track three and then especially uh savantes track four which um just to let you know tom uh mm-hmm. you know he the the chorus there he goes Cervantes, Cervantes. Yeah. I, I, it is not, it's Cervantes. It's not Sea Monsters, <laughs> sea mon- which is what sea I thought monsters. for a That's long a, time. It does kind of sound like that. I never <laughs> thought that. But, but the thing is, is that that chorus gets stuck in your head. Oh, you, yeah. You listen it's catchy. to catchy. And the thing about these songs is I actually think that the the verses, and, th- and this is a pretty typical um, musical trope for for uh, bands in this in this genre back in the day, but but I don't think that the verses are all that strong for the mm-hmm. mo- most of the time. They're they're pretty generic, right? It's the choruses that that really shine and make this special. Yeah, I think that this album shows a lot of potential as a debut. You know, listening to it in hindsight over twenty years after it came out. And knowing where Spoon would go, it makes a little bit more sense. Um, but listening to it in such a detached environment uh, from the context of when it came out, it's really neat to listen to because what you hear is you hear a band that I actually think they have a lot of their performance chops pretty well nailed down uh, for such a young band. Britt Daniels' vocal edge is there. I think he still grows as a vocalist, especially to match with the stylistic changes that they'll make on their next few records. Uh, but he's got he's got the talent. You can tell that right away. I think a lot of bands' debuts don't have even this level of confidence exhibited, and especially yeah. the fact that they're willing. You know, you're absolutely right. They they rely a bit too heavily on the choruses here, which is something they grow out of. Well, it's like they um, knew it was their strength, right? And, and so and they so, played off. Yes, of it. Mm-hmm. absolutely. I mean, I can look at most of the songs mm-hmm. on this record just the, just looking at the track titles and get the chorus of that song stuck in my head and i believe that that that's a combination of things one how they name the songs they yeah. name the songs using a, a song title that is that is a lyric in the chorus that's that, an important thing i think a lot of people listeners and bands alike overlook but naming the song strategically so that people will recognize it yeah absolutely but then also just writing a killer hook in the chorus mm-hmm. uh, but but throughout telefono spoon prioritized performances and energy over the songwriting ideas and craft uh, and, and you can hear that that they have a lot of ideas that they're playing with. Uh, it's not like the songwriting is super super basic, and they haven't at, at all started to minimize their sound. Mm-hmm. It is it is a wall of sound approach. There's a lot of detail here, um, and and that shows that there's this like spark of creativity underneath the sheen of the distortion that you hear in each of these songs. Following Cervantes, a couple other highlights for me. Directly following that, we have Nefarious, and then a couple tracks later, Dismember Two particularly Pixies-esque tracks due to the the supporting female vocals um, from bass player and and backup vocalist Annie McGuire on those two tracks. Uh, So that just once again just reminds you where their influences are are coming from. Uh, I also I actually find the uh, the closing track Plastic Mylar to be a, a pretty memorable yeah, one the, as well. Sp- Spoon knows how to pick a, a solid closing track. Mm-hmm. What's interesting about this, and and I think this speaks to the Wire influence. And throughout these songs, you have uh, a- occasional like the the drum beat v- very much mimics a, a punk drum beat, and the bass obviously mimics punk bass at times but you see that wire influence coming out which which spoon has has self-described them as being heavily influenced by wire Mm -hmm. but also in the track lengths a a number of these tracks are are i mean the average track length has to be around two minutes long yeah um there's 14 songs on this record and it's 35 minutes long another another influence i would cite from them is robert pollard and guided by voices who put out albums of like 30 plus tracks that are like around 30 minutes. Um, Some of the short track lengths definitely called to uh, Guided by Voices. And I think that we'll see that even more on the next album. All right, before we get to the next 
LP they put out. In 1997, Spoon put out the Soft Effects EP, still on Matador. Well, they've got a couple EPs between this one and then they put out another one in 2000 that we'll get to. And I think that these are important to mention. You know, we won't get into them too much detail, but I think they're important to mention because they act as nice bridges stylistically. So where we see Spoon going from Telefono to Soft Effects is the sound gets a little bit more grounded, a little bit tighter, and while there's still kind of this raucous attitude to it, I think they're presenting it uh, much more cleanly and much drier. Uh, And that's where we see them move into a series of sneaks in 1998. But one important thing that happened uh, as we move into a series of sneaks, their second LP, is they signed to Elektra Records. They signed to a major label after being on Matador for just one LP and one EP. And they actually weren't overly pleased with the uh, with the response of Telefono. I think they were hoping that it would do more for them, sure. uh, but it, it didn't. So they had concerns about signing to a major label at that point in their career, um, but they actually, you know, it was Electra, which is the, the label that signed Pixies. So once again, following in the footsteps, and it probably just at the time seemed like the right choice. Uh, one thing that, uh, and we're getting a little bit out of order, but I think it's important to mention this before we get into the music on a series of sneaks, is right when the album came out, uh, the, the A&R guy at Electra Records who helped get them signed, a guy named Ron Lafitte, he uh, actually, he left the company uh, the album did not do that well, and then subsequently Spoon was dropped from Elektra, which was a huge blow to them, and I think very crushing for Britt Daniel, uh, because, you know, I mean, what a, what a way to shake a, a budding artist's confidence, right? Uh, and also disillusionment with the entire music industry, which has garnered a lot of criticism uh, in the way that it can kind of use and abuse artists like that. So, uh, the album didn't do all that well commercially, but was really well received critically. Yeah, and they has started been getting since. yeah they started getting a lot of of attention from critics as as being uh, kind of like a, a unique sound, kind of a fresh indie sound. And and as as cool as that is, I mean, you kind of want the sales to go along with it. I mean, right. these guys these guys are trying are, are trying to become and be professional musicians. They want to go on tours. They want to release new music. They want to write all day long. They, and they don't want to live like hobos, right? And I think that, you know, they, a little bit, I think people get a little bit too uh, up in arms about artists who sell out and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And, and Britt Daniels is, is, has, from what I've read, been, been very transparent about the fact that they just, wanted, they just wanted to get famous enough that they could get by, right? right. To, they wanted to be successful. And I think, and I kind of admire the fact that they took this seriously enough. Um, that they were going to put albums together that that got them places that they did take it seriously and wanted to see some success. Mm-hmm. It's a very professional attitude. That's what I want to see in yeah. in artists because it means that you're going to value the entire experience. You're really going to put your all into it. Mm-hmm. And I think a series of sneaks is certainly in that direction. Now, the first thing I would say about this album, and keep in mind, this came out in May of 1998 on Electra. Um, it, you hear them transitioning from that pixies wire influence towards that more patented sound or or quasi patented so- sound that they have uh that they, that they've become known for mm-hmm. in the in the later 2000s and 2010s and it's still it's still though it's very guitar oriented i think that's something that we'll see them you know they there will always be a guitar band at heart but i think we'll start to see on subsequent albums guitar playing a more supportive role here it's still very much the focus but they're starting to expand it a little bit more right this is still very much like an electric guitar bass drums and vocals band but they're starting to bring in an acoustic guitar here Mm -hmm. and there they're starting to play with a little bit more instead of the the uh electric guitar having like a rhythm and then a lead or you're starting to hear uh the electric guitar switch from these like clangy accent parts and then doing more like atmospheric pieces as well and in that focus that subtle shift on atmosphere especially in the guitars um is is very key to understanding the transition point that a series of sneaks really uh hides you know they're not using the a lot of auxiliary instrumentation yet um, but they're still in, in, approaching their songwriting from a more varied perspective. They're showing that growth, and maybe some of that's coupled with just with just you know um, higher fidelity engineering techniques being on a major le- re- major label record, um, and 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 the other tools at their disposal that you gain from such a, a jump. You know, mm-hmm. in the sound though, they you know they've taken a lot of the explosive, boundless 
attitude and energy of Telefono, and I think that they hone it a lot better on this album. Uh, you know, it's almost like when Bruce Banner becomes the Hulk, right? Uh, at first, he doesn't really know how to control himself, and then it gets to the point where he can kind of still, you know, do what he wants to do when he's the Hulk. That's that's a series of sneaks to me. It still has some of that punk attitude, um, but it's toned down a little bit, and it focuses more on the songwriting, lets the songwriting shine more. Um, one One example of that to me is like, uh, track nine chloroform it's a minute and 10 seconds long another one that has kind of like the format of a guided by voices shorter track uh, but has more of a style of like a like a like a bush b-side it almost sounds like the sound song format sounds kind of like a glycerine to me sure. by bush because it's just this good distorted guitar and vocals with a very grungy vocal presentation uh, but I think it's it's a great piece of songwriting, and at hardly over a minute long, it's actually one of the tracks that really sticks with me. I think that the kind of tact that they're showing on songs like that... Uh, is something we didn't quite see as much on Telefono. I think if they had taken that track and tried to incorporate it into Telefono, it would have been another big, bombastic drum, bass, and guitar song. Yeah, focus that maybe on the two chorus. and a half or three minutes, right? And and have a defined chorus. Yeah. Whereas they they just let that live a short life, and and it actually is more impactful to the album mm -hmm. because of it. So that we're really starting to see that tact show here. You, you also see in their songwriting uh, more emphasis on creative song structures, mm -hmm. and they're not. It's and then let's let's be real here they're not they're not getting too crazy it's just not verse chorus verse chorus like on telefono and in telefono i think they actually presented that really well and here you're just starting to see a little bit of evolution a good example is one of my favorite tracks on this record track two the minor tough pure extension It's, it's a little bit slower. It starts off, starts off slower. The guitar has a bit of a darker sound to it. And then it has this really nice build and a lot of like really clangy um, accent electric guitars. And, and Britt Daniels does a great job with the vocal presentation on this track. So you get a little bit of a build and not so much emphasis on that chorus, the, the big dynamic contrast in the chorus. So I, I really liked seeing that. Also on track seven, um, Metal Detector, which is another one of my uh, mm -hmm. track picks from this this record. It's a little bit uh, kind of more, I'd classify this as kind of soft rock, and it shows what Spoon can do without the emphasis on intensity and really focusing on, st like, like they're starting to play with that idea of creating a sense of space in the sound, um, mm -hmm. focusing more on on Britt Daniels' uh, vocal melodies as as the main songwriting device that carries the idea of the song. And as they start to focus on those vocal melodies, I think they also get better about not relying on the choruses. You mentioned that with the song structure, but even the songs where they don't mix up the structure as much, I think the verses the are verses stronger. The verses are much stronger. Um, you yeah. hear that on Metal Detector. You also hear that a lot on my favorite track on the album, the closing track, Advanced Cassette. I agree. That I cannot get that song out of my head. And, and the reason is because for me, the verses are just as catchy as the choruses. Mm -hmm. That song also it feels straight out of the pavement catalog. Yep. Um, we're, so we're starting to see, you know, a, a little bit more of the alternative rock side that's maybe Maybe not as uh, not as aggressive, but they're still able to make it work. I don't think I'll ever hear that sad song again. Don't tell me I've lost you. I've I think that for me, you know, a series of sneaks here. This is probably one of their most consistently good albums, like straight through. Even though there are, t to me, a few songs that are, are maybe less memorable than some of the highlights, once again, still, this is an album I can put on and, and really enjoy. And, and I actually have a problem with it, just for yeah. how consistent it is. I really feel like you get two types of song here, about two-thirds of the tracks on here are, are almost carbon copies of one another, mm -hmm. sound very, very similar, and the back half of this record really suffers up until the closing track, Advanced Cassette. Um, yeah, I think that's fair. And 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 I really feel that that this album just doesn't 
uh, it, it shows that there's just, it, it, it's a 33 minute record. It's 14 tracks again, and it feels longer than 33 minutes. And to yeah, me, that's true. And, and to me, that just shows that you have not enough ideas in your songwriting. Um, they, they were really trying to hone in their sound, I think, here and come up with like a consistent sound. And they do. I mean, if you put this on, it, it's a consistent record, but almost to a fault, you know? Mm-hmm. And it, and an almost, it almost kind of, it, it needs more life to really fill its space. And that's, saying something when it's only 33 minutes long Mm -hmm. following a series of sneaks they put out a a two-track single uh the agony of lafitte which uh play on the agony of defeat uh and also referencing ron lafitte the the uh the record label guy who they feel kind of screwed them over and left them in the dust from electra uh, and and that those two tracks have have in you know in historical revisionism been added to a series of sneaks at the end. I actually think that those two tracks make a lot more sense on their own and not as part of a series of sneaks. I, I prefer for this album to end after advanced cassette. Uh, but what those two tracks do is I think they demonstrate once again, as you said, Jake, uh, on a series of sneaks, they they continue to expand on the band's ability to make something a little more low key uh, and focus more on Brit Daniels vocal melodies. I think that those two tracks are are still really good on their own. So following a series of sneaks and following the agony of Lafitte in 1999, that two track single, they still came out with an EP in 2000 called love ways. And I think what love ways is a bridge between their style on a series of sneaks and the style that we'll see on their next LP, uh, Girls Can Tell, which comes out in 2001, is we see them continue to incorporate more a sl- more of a slight pop sound into their into their style. Um, but where on the Love Ways EP, I think what you hear is them doing that really successfully in the instrumentation. But I don't think that Britt Daniels' vocals had quite caught up to it yet. He still sounds a little bit throaty. He still sounds like kind of a rock guy. Um, but I'll tell you what, between that EP and Girls Can Tell, he really ironed out the kinks because this album turned out fantastically. February of 2001, Girls Can Tell drops. This is Spoon's third record, and it could not be more different than their first album. Yeah, It, it, is, it is probably, I would say, Spoon's... Um, I, I would go as far to, as to say this is Spoon's darkest record. Um, it just yeah. in, it just in that it is it is it, there's some gloom in the in the mood here. I think you have to dig a little bit for it, um, but you can kind of hear it in some of Britt Daniels' uh, lyrics, which. Um, you know, we really haven't talked much about lyrics uh, yet, and I, I would say that um, the reason is is because uh, Britt Daniels' lyrics are are extremely es- esoteric, mm-hmm. and and it's it's very hard to relate to them. Yet they're they're um, catchy enough and relatable enough that you remember like certain lyrics that will For stick sure. out, um, and. And and it really uh, I I think kind of sells the song. It's kind of like a more focused poppy version of like the what what um, the national does. Yeah, I would agree with that. And with the national comparison, I think like what I would expand on that with is that Spoon's lyrics rarely feel like they have any deeper meaning, but at a surface level, they're still provocative enough to make you feel something yeah. off of them. Yeah. But I think that on Girls Can Tell, we actually hear some of the more meaningful lyrics in their catalog, I especially totally on the first that. two tracks. I totally agree agree with that. Everything Hits at Once is the opening track to Girls Can Tell. And that has this like soft, is it MIDI? Is it a MIDI keyboard? Uh, it's it's like a, it's uh, a Mellotron. Mellotron, mm-hmm. okay. So it's a, it's a Mellotron, which Tom, you're going to know the details of what exactly that is and how it sounds and what comprises sounds. But the, the aesthetic um, uh, effect that that has, it's, it's such a soft, um, kind of comforting, uh, sort of, of key sound. And then this just like really nice sounding, uh, electric guitar line mm-hmm. comes in on top of that. Um, and Britt Daniels, when his vocals come in, he's almost whispering, which is totally different than anything right. he's done on the previous two records. And immediately the listener, if you followed Spoon's first two albums, when you, when you put on Girls Can Tell, uh, for the first time in February of 2001, you had to be going, what the hell is this? Because, because it is, it is such a different sonic experience.
they these guys clearly have just decided that they are going to change their sound. They're they're incorporating a whole variety of new instruments. This is no longer on Girls Can Tell a a electric guitar, bass, drums, yeah. and vocal band. They are incorporating all sorts of different instruments into their sound here, from from different uh, key based instruments um, to to just actual piano to some string accents at parts um, to to bells and other things. The whole instrumental palette has expanded mm-hmm. tenfold and and it totally influences their sound they're they're focused on space they're focused on um providing melody without a ton of dynamic intensity um and they're focused on the uh, of a vast instrumental palette so i i have a theory about this i have a hypothesis and and this is like conspiracy theories with Tom, right? So this is just speculation. I don't have anything to back this up. But I, I suspect, I suspect that Britt Daniels as a songwriter had the ability to do this the whole time. But think about how the musical landscape changed in the five years between Telefono and Girls Can Tell, and even more importantly, the eight years between when the band formed and when they made Girls Can Tell. The band formed... In what was really, you know, kind of the peak of the grunge movement before it started declining, right? And then their first album came out in kind of the height of what was the post-grunge movement. But I think that they were kind of a step behind that. I think they put out Telefono when people were starting to get disenchanted with that sound, and that's probably why it never took off the way that they wanted it to. Well, in 2001, you know, people, that was when people were really getting into new metal, and Spoon was obviously not going to go in that direction. That wasn't really in them to do. Well, there was this pretty indie scene kind of underneath everything. Exactly. So they were, I think they were at a pivoting point where they really could have gone in either direction from where they had established themselves. So they could have gone new metal. (laughs) I think they could have. They could have pulled off a Saint Anger. But, (laughs) oh God, yeah, that's what every band wants to do. Um, but what Britt Daniel instead, I think it allowed him to feel more comfortable incorporating other influences because this is a guy who loves Motown. This is a guy who loved artists like the Supremes and even other sixties bands like the Beatles. Uh, he wasn't really incorporating that into the songwriting in their first albums because would it really have gotten anywhere, them anywhere? In, in what was popular in the 90s, right. I and don't the, think it would and, have. And we already know that Spoon, they're very strategic in, right. in what they're going for. They they specifically went after a sound. And and I think at this point, too, after getting dropped from Elektra, you also have to, to think about how that affected the songwriting process. Mm-hmm. Because th- this album does have like undertones of, of being a little bit darker and more depressing. Yeah. And, and after being dropped by a major label, I mean, climbing the ladder and then falling down a peg and returning to an indie label, mm-hmm. um, it, that, that, you know, like obviously that had an effect on the band. Um, and, and so, I mean, it was probably time for them to change. I mean, if I went through that, trying to empathize yep. a bit here, if I went through that, I would I would probably go, okay, well, maybe I'm just going to just screw it. I'm just going to do kind of write music that I think is cool mm-hmm. and, and try out some new ideas. And it just so happened to work. And, it did. And, and Girls Can Tell, um, uh, as I said earlier, is, what, is the album that I really got into, what got me into Spoon. Um, and I would say at this point it's probably not m- my top spoon album but it's up there yeah um and and the reason is is because it it hits um it it strikes kind of like all the chords it needs to it has really really strong uh strong there's like a group of really strong tracks in this album but the whole thing plays as a great album listening experience it does yeah whereas a series of sneaks as i i mentioned a few minutes ago a series of sneaks by the end of it i'm bored i'm i'm done and that's a problem when when it's only 33 minutes long this is 11 tracks and 36 minutes long and when it ends i want to put it on again and that's a sign that they did a really nice job in the mm-hmm. songwriting department they, every one of these songs is crafted in such a way that it never outstays its welcome and there's enough variation in the songwriting styles on the songs that you don't get bored of it um in it in addition it it does kind of hit that that right mood i like the the um, more uh, simple aesthetic that they went for here. I, I like that um, there's the, the different instrumentation that they use, the the more piano and, and different key-based instruments. Um, I like the, the vibe that that gives and the chords that they used here um, just, I think, speak to a different audience mm-hmm. than the previous two records did. Now, that's not to say that they abandoned the rock sound. No, not at all. There's a lot of great guitar highlights on here. I think the guitar shows a lot of edge in track two, Believing is Art. Uh, 
Another one of my favorite tracks on here is track five, The Fitted Shirt, with its just kind of nice, like, staccato guitar romp, a uh, really nice driving beat. I seem so directly applied. The fitted shirt hung on me. So there's still guitar on here, but it just, I think this is where, as I mentioned earlier, we start to see guitar play more of a supportive role because they're expanding the instrumentation. They know when to incorporate it, but they're not relying on it as much. They're not relying on their guitar chops. Now, Jake, I, I think you probably like this album a little bit better than me. I still like this one a lot, and I think it's one of Spoon's more solid albums, more cons one of their more consistent albums. Um, but also for me, my my favorite tracks happen to be on the first half. I don't, I don't, I think it's slightly front heavy for that reason. But that's not to say the back half is weak. Sure. Uh, I still really enjoy that. And actually, one highlight on the back half for me is is track 8, 10, 20 a.m., which is kind of a ballad track. I think that's a really yeah. good one. A couple of highlights on the back half for me are track 7, Take a Walk, has a really uh, nice uh, chorus, and then also Take the Fifth. So they're taking a mm -hmm. walk and taking the fifth. They're really into taking things, and girls can tell, because they got dropped, you know? <laughs> yeah, they're, 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 they take what take, they can. They're going to take whatever they can get, and this, that's what this album's really all about. Mm -hmm. That was a terrible joke. <laughs> In a quick turnaround between albums, we go on from 2001's Girls Can Tell to 2002's Kill the Moonlight, which, which sees them move into even more erratic territory when it comes to the instrumentation they're putting together. Uh, they're, they're using piano a lot more on this album, like on tracks like The Way We Get By. They're using drum machines and loops more often. Uh, they even, they even on, on track four, Stay Don't Go, have kind of a beatboxed rhythm going on in the background. And, and I wonder if that change in production style is because they brought in another producer um, Mike McCarthy, mm -hmm. um, who, who I think after this went on to coach the Green Bay Packers. <laughs> that's, that's quite a career path. Yeah, yeah. But he did, he did well at both, so. <laughs> I'll take your word for it. <laughs> Kill the Moonlight, stylistically, is kind of a jump. And, and this one saw them garner even more critical acclaim, I think because of the sense of experimentation. I would attribute it to that. What I think is interesting here, and I'll just get my opinions in the forefront here because I think that'll kind of guide the conversation, um, just to be honest, but I actually think this album's a little bit overrated. I still think it's a very good album, but I think, Jake, one of the reasons I never dived into Spoon too much before we did this podcast is because you remember in the very early Velocities and Music days, we, we reviewed this album, and I remember everyone just loving it. It got rave reviews, very high score on Metacritic, and I thought it was all right. Uh, and going back, I just realized I think there are several Spoon albums that I like a lot more than this one. Uh, for me, that's because I think this album has a great sense of experimentation. I love the sounds. I love how adventurous they're being. Because they go from Girls Can Tell, which is... Uh, which, as you said, Jake, is kind of a gloomy record. They're starting to experiment with more instruments, but but each track still feels like kind of a rock song. On Kill the Moonlight, they, they just abandon all of that. They abandon yeah. all sense of instrumental structure. The things driving the rhythms here are different from from track to track. The rules are gone. Not just drum beats. Right. The rules they, are gone. They, they abandon all of that, and I think that's really cool, but I don't feel like the songwriting driving it is, is their best. I think that compared to Girls Can Tell, I think Girls Can Tell just has much stronger songwriting and sense of melody and, and sense of, of chord structures, just, just all of that. So I think Kill the Moonlight is an interesting style piece, but it's not one I feel like coming back to a lot. It's, it's the one that as we prepared for this, just kind of glossed over me as I listened to it. I, I totally agree with you. When we reviewed this, I think we were a little lukewarm on it. And mm -hmm. <laughs> to be candid, nothing has changed for yeah. me. I still feel very similarly about this record. Um, I love the sense of experimentation that they're going with in the sound. I love that they're throwing out the rules. And I think that, like, I appreciate this album and in, in its place in Spoon disco Spoon's discography a little bit more because it helps me understand how they went from Girls Can Tell, which I think is a darn near perfect record, um, towards some of their later works with, with Gimme Fiction, Gaga Ga, 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 and, and the subsequent albums, um, which we'll get to. But, but I think Kill the Moonlight, the thing that they did here is because they kind of threw the rules 
rules out about what makes a like it's it's no longer tied to hey we're a rock band we gotta right. have those typical rock tropes here um, and now now they are able to just experiment a lot more with atmosphere um, and they did that but I think they did that at the sacrifice of like a, a uh, cohesive sound song yeah. structure and and when you when you are writing songs with the mental vision that you are a rock band that that provides a sort of structure to your songs. It provides structure, but if you if you adhere too much to it, can be limiting. Absolutely. But if you abandon it too much, then you lose sense of cohesion. Absolutely. And and that latter part is is and I and I feel like a series of snakes. They were adhering too much to it. Mm-hmm. I feel like on Kill the Moonlight, they went too much in the other direction. And girls can tell in this early transitory period of yep. Fruit Spoon's discography, the girls can tell kind of hit that right in the middle. I and totally that's why, agree. And that's why I like it so much. Where whereas I where Kill the Moonlight here. Besides the track, The Way We Get By, mm-hmm. I'm not sure this album has any true highlights. I really like track eight, Don't, Don't Let It Get You Down. There are a couple other tracks like Jonathan, Jonathan Fist, track five, uh, a little bit Paper Tiger, track six, which is very minimalistic. It's built around just drum clicks and atmospheric guitar that I like. If a tiger can tell you where he stands, we'll go back tonight the way that we came. Starting to see the track lengths get a little bit longer on this one, kind of mm-hmm. edging towards late two and a half to, to three minute tracks. Um, but, but I really feel like most of these are, are, are very atmospheric based. They're focusing on the guitars are merely like accent pieces. Um, but, uh, there's a lot of use of piano here. Mm -hmm. There just aren't a lot of standout tracks on this, on this record. And most are middle of the road for spoon and and really i do think that because of that it's a step down for girls can tell but a necessary step in the uh, stepping stone in the spoon right. discography to get towards where they're going with some of some of their later I, albums i agree i think they had to make it so that they could show themselves what they were capable of so that they could show themselves what they could incorporate into a song and expand on their palette because we're going to see that through the rest of their discography in a very successful way. And I think we should talk, before we before we go, I think we need to talk a little bit more about The Way We Get By. Okay. Because that song got huge. It was a huge for them. It, yeah. it was, this, that song uh, was released as a single, and man, did it have commercial success. It was used in, in a ton of different movies. Um, just just really put the band on the map. And all of a sudden, Britt Daniel's dream came came true, mm-hmm. and, and they're getting some commercial and critical success. Go to sleep to shake. This album, while Tom and I might not be c- quite as keen on it, um, you know, I'm, it's certainly, certainly, I don't think we are in the norm here. I think most people mm-hmm. really like Kill the Moonlight and see this as as one of Spoon's best albums. And I and I I get why. I would just kind of argue why I think against that. Right. I, I and I'm on the same page as you, but I think that one of the reasons it got to that point is because, to their credit. I think that this is the album where Britt Daniels really hit his stride as a vocalist. I, I agree with that. As a, and, and well, like, the emphasis is totally on Britt Daniels at this it point. It is. Like, because, because everything else got stripped out. Everything else got stripped out and is purely uh, playing a supporting role to right. his vocals. But I think that was a smart move on this album because his vocals were so damn good. Yeah, and and true. And mostly in the, in the performance department. I still think that sometimes the melodies are a little lacking on this album. But his performances are great. I mean, I think that's why the song The Way We Get By got so popular because think about how specific, how well honed his vocal performance is on that song. In the verse where you just have that nice piano, it's nice and smooth, and then you get to the chorus, and he's kind of harsh, but he's not harsh in a way that you really feel contrasts with anything in a bad he's way. A he's got that bite. Yeah, he he really found his balance as a performer yeah, and, on this and album. And he controls the intensity of the song and really conveys he mm-hmm. he's he I mean Britt Daniel is spoon. He he is the the intensity 
fulcrum of this band mm-hmm. and that that takes kind of a, a mastery of their music like he, he's kind of the the maestro up there kind of guiding the songs along yeah. and, and and i mean to me kill the moonlight gave us the way we get by and i could listen to that song on repeat in perpetuity i mm-hmm. i freaking love that song yeah um and and so for that i mean if if the you told me that the album was just you know 12 tracks of the way we get by i'd probably like it more um, <laughs> but i still appreciate what they accomplished here All right, Tom, we've had a lot to say about Spoon through their first four albums. So we're going to leave off here after Kill the Moonlight in 2002 and pick up with Spoon's fifth album, Gimme Fiction, which came out in 2005 in our next podcast, which will be Spoon Part 2. Thank you guys for your continued support and participation. Tom and I love all of your comments on our YouTube videos, your Facebook messages, and your emails to us. Your participation is what makes Velocities and Music possible. So as always, thank you for being awesome. I'm Jake. I'm Tom. We are Velocities and Music, moving music discussion forward. (laughs) 